أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين المجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله إلا بالله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وسلم Mu'mineen, mu'minat, brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, salamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <coughs> We're trying to go from this station of Muslim to mu'min, from Islam to Iman, from individuals who simply claim to believe something, to raise our station to this level of Iman that we're actually practicing what we believe. We said one of the ways to do this is to start, to start to have a deep, rational, intellectual, logical understanding of the usul al-deen, the basic fundamentals of our religion. We started discussing Tawheed. We proved the existence of Allah. We showed that theories such as the Big Bang cannot and do not disprove the existence of Allah. We finished our discussion last night on justice. We mentioned that it is rationally impossible for Allah to do any injustice to us in fact, everything He does for us is khair, it's good. It's us in our limited perception when we view things as being evil or unjust or dhulm. The last piece of advice we gave last night was that if we want to start to change the way that we view our reality, to improve ourselves, whenever something afflicts us, whenever something bad happens, we can do two things, right? We can say, Alhamdulillah. Because if something bad is actually taking place, one of the reasons it could be happening is that it's actually paying our sins forward. We're getting a punishment shipped ahead of time over here rather than having to wait into a different dimension, a higher dimension where the punishment would be more intense. So, alhamdulillah, we would say whenever something bad afflicts us. And then in addition, we would say astaghfirullah because we're always trying to make sure that we can cover up the sins that we've been committing throughout our lives. So, tawheed and adal now, we've completed. So the natural next stage in progression that we've learned is nubuwa, it's prophethood. So what do we have to discuss here? First, a few questions that we're going to go through. Number one is, what does nubuwa actually mean? What does it mean to be a prophet? What is prophethood? Why do we need these prophets in the first place? You know, why can't we figure things out without them? You know, some have this idea that our aql, our intellect, our brains are enough and we shouldn't need somebody else to come and tell us what to do. And after having proved that we do need somebody who has a connection to Allah, a prophet, then we're going to say, how do we distinguish between individuals? If somebody comes and claims that they're a prophet, how do we know whether they're telling the truth or not? Is there some specific characteristics that a prophet should have? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So first, the meaning of nubuwa, prophethood. So our ulama give us two possibilities, right? Nubuwa could come from the word nubu. Nubu means something is high, something is elevated. So in this sense, when you talk about a nabi, it's not just a literal prophet. They say it's somebody elevated in a superior position. So naturally, that nabi, having that higher status, that higher position, is getting information that we can't get. And because of that position, it makes sense for him to come and give that to us and for us to follow him. Other ulama say it doesn't come from Nabu, but it comes from Naba. Just like Surah Naba, right? Chapter 78. So Naba means khabar, it means news. What they say is that in this sense, uh, Nabi is actually a mukhbir, somebody who gives you khabar, somebody who gives you information. And that information that he's relaying is information that you and I don't have direct access to, right? This prophet, this Nabi, this mukhbir is getting special kind of say divine newspapers, reading that, however he does, downloading that information and coming and sharing that with us. So there's two different opinions. Either a Nabi is somebody who has this higher status, this elevated status, and because of that elevated status, that's how they get this position, or it's because they have this, this kind of exclusive access to information that none of us can have. Well, if you want to compromise and say it's both, then that makes sense too, doesn't it? Okay. The next question we have to answer is, why do we need these individuals? Why do we need some higher status individual, somebody who gets 
this specific, specific divine information, why don't, don't we have access to that same thing or not? So what have we done so far in these two nights? We've already proven that we have the existence of a creator, right, who's created everything, this master, this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sustaining God. Our existence comes from him. Everything's existence comes from Allah. And we've showed that this all-powerful wajib al-wujud, this necessary existence, is also possessing the qualities of goodness and justice. And that's all that Allah can manifest. It's something good. It means khair. So, okay, naturally, somebody having believed in this creator and knowing that this creator is good, okay, we want to make sure that everything we do in our lives is according to what that creator wants. Okay, so we're going to have this question, okay, what exactly do you want, Allah? What do you want us to do in our lives? How exactly do we do what you want? How do we worship you? How do we thank you? What exactly are we doing here? You know, have you ever gotten a toy when you were younger? And, um, you know, like a remote control car or some sort of electronic device. And, you know, you rip it open and you want to play with it right away, right? You rip it open, you take everything out, you take all the packaging off, you take the toy out, and you try to use it, right? Like, let's say it's a remote control car. You put the car down, you grab the remote control, and you try to start using it, and it doesn't work. And what happens? You flip around the box, and you see those three deadly words, batteries not included. And your heart breaks, right? This is not the musibat part. This is, I'm giving you, like, a life story here. So naturally, as a child, you're going to think, you know, whoever gave this gift, however nice it was, you're doing a little bit of vulm to me, right? If you wanted to give me a gift, you should have given me everything. You know, a couple extra dollars, you could have attached some batteries, and I could have played with it right away. So in that sense, as kind of foolish and childish as the example is, some of us have that same idea when it comes to our creation, our existence. Allah should have provided us with something. We're expecting Allah, okay... If you want us to, you know, use this existence you've given us for your benefit, or not, not his benefit, but if you want us to do what you want, Allah, then you better give us the tools, right? You have to let us know what you want. How are we going to live? And how are we going to exist? How do we worship you? If you leave us alone, then you're actually not being just. Now, but we've already proven his justice, so that means there's something he's given to us that we have to use. So somebody comes and says, okay, he's given us an intellect. The intellect is the way that we can figure out what Allah wants. Right? And you have many individuals who say, you don't need a prophet, you don't need an imam, you don't need any special individuals. You don't need these clergy, this special class of clerics, you don't need ulama and marajit. These guys are unnecessary. You and I can just use our brains, use our aqal, use our intellect. We can rationalize and you know, think deeply and reflect and you know, dance around in Sufi zikr circles, I don't know, whatever you do. And you can come to these ideas and say, all right, this is what Allah wants from me. One of the proofs that they offer, people who think like this, is that, okay, everybody already knows things like murder is bad. We know stealing is bad. Lying is bad. So everybody already has these tools built in. It's almost as if Allah's put in the batteries already. Right? We're working. We're thinking. We already know what's right and wrong. But what happens when the things get a bit more tricky, right? The questions get a bit deeper. Let's see if we can solve that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You know, sometimes individuals, they make this claim that, you know, God wants us to be good, and that's about it. I can be good without being a Muslim, or I can be a good Muslim without having to follow these laws or anything like that, right? Makes sense, huh? So, okay, murder, fine, I know that's bad. Stealing, lying, cheating, all these things, we know it's bad. But now, what happens if all of us who are trying to live together in a society, which we're forced to do, we've all been created at the same time, we're trying to live together, we're trying to establish a Muslim identity, and a few of us were like, okay, we all know murder is bad, but then somebody comes and murders one of us. Now what are we going to do? One person says, well, you know, my intellect tells us that this person who murdered, we have to just, you know, eye for an eye, we need to murder them. Somebody else says, well, my intellect is telling me that that's not going to be enough, right? We have to do something more. We need to start deterring other people from doing the same thing, because if somebody doesn't have a problem with dying, right? They can still go around and murder other individuals. So what we need to do is not just murder that murder, you know, execute that murder. We should kill their family too, right? Because then everybody else will know how serious we are and how much we want to establish law and justice in our society, right? Okay, somebody else says, no, 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 we can't do anything like that. 
you know, the God that I believe in is a God of love and mercy and compassion and, you know, the stuff written in Hallmark cards and all that. We can't, we can't punish anybody. Right? We just have to be kind and loving. And, you know. So, okay, he might have murdered. Let's just, just forgive him. Just leave him alone. Then what's going to happen? That person will keep going around and murdering because they know that there's not going to be any punishment for them. Then they'll be all alone, and then finally maybe they'll regret that they did all this. So what's the point here? The point is, yeah, for the general stuff, maybe we can all agree that murdering and lying and cheating and all that stuff's bad. Fine. But there's a lot of issues out there that we can't agree on. Right? And this is not just people who are you know, arguing about whether God exists or not. Us as Muslims, us specifically as Shia Muslims, if you want to be even more specific, people who follow the same marja argue about that marja's ruling, and they can't agree on what the marja's ruling is. Right? And you see this happening a lot, of, a lot of the time. Same marja, and they're sitting there ready to fight one another just because they can't agree on what their marja is saying. Which is, let me not open up that can of worms of why that happens. We'll leave that, maybe for another day. I already got in trouble last night for sending Trump to hell, so I don't want to get in trouble even more, right? You see, this argument takes place in you know, all degrees. People who are religious and people who are irreligious. You know, people who say all we need is the intellect. Like, okay, if all you needed was the intellect, why is it that those who are strictly intellectuals, for example, let's say scientists now, who claim that all they use is scientific evidence, empirical research, how is it that all these scientific discussions, they don't agree either, right? Well, the discussion we never got to have was the discussion about evolution, but I think it's a good topic for what we're mentioning right now. If evolution is just supposed to be based on empirical evidence, right? That's it, pure intellect, nothing more. Then why is it that there are many scientists out there, many biologists out there who say, listen, there isn't enough strong, ev uh, strong evidence for evolution. And these people are shunned from the scientific community. It's like, okay, if the intellect is supposed to be so strong and superior, and it's just like a calculator, right? There's no emotions involved. Then how can, these guys, how can you guys disagree on everything? On every single thing. Doctors will say the same thing. We can't agree, although they're using just peer-reviewed research, but they're still disagreeing as well. So it's not just us being in religion. Everybody has disagreements. Now, if Allah is just, and He wants us to exist in a society, coexist peacefully, then He should have sent down one way for us to live. And we all know this naturally, right? We want conformity in a society. We want to be able to live peacefully so that our society doesn't erupt in chaos. So what is the way that we're going to be able to do that? Let me give a verse of Quran just to get our minds ready for this. So in Surah Yunus, chapter 10, verse 36, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَا يَتَّبِعُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا ظَنَّا You know, most people think that they're following their intellects, but Allah says here, you know, most people, they actually just follow their dhan, their assumptions, their conjectures. It's actually not strict burhan or rational logical proofs. You know, a lot of times, like we had mentioned before when we first talked about what does it mean to be rational? What does it mean to be logical? If you haven't studied the science of logic, right, mantiq, if you don't know what that is, then you don't formally know what it means to be logical, right? How to form your premises and make a conclusion. That's a science in and of itself. Most people, they're saying that they're, you know, being rational and logical. And like we gave that example on Facebook, right? Let's say somebody comes out, they put up a status that, you know, the, um, you know, let's say when super, the bat, you know, Batman vs. Superman came out. They say, well, this is, this, we obviously know that, you know, Superman's gonna win, right? He's stronger. And somebody responds to him, you know, they come out in the status, like, what are you talking about? Batman is obviously more superior. His intellect is, is higher. Of course you could beat Superman. And people are just going back and forth on nonsensical issues like this. I mean, obviously it's not debatable, because you know Batman's better. But, you know, let's leave that aside. Because obviously the intellect trumps everything, right? But I don't want to open that up. That's another discussion, too, right? We have to set up a, a, sef a separate ashra just about Batman versus Superman, because I can go on for days about that. But people in that, in the midst of these arguments, like you're being irrational, you're being illogical. No, you're actually both being irrational and logical because you don't know what logic means. You don't know the rules. It's almost, let me give an example kind of to strengthen this point. Let's say for example, somebody comes and gives you, has three apples in their hand, right? Three apples. And they tell you, okay, take away two of these. You take away two of the apples. You ask them, okay, how many apples do you have? You say two. Say, okay, three take away two is two. Now you're all like, you know, that's, that's wrong, that's not correct. It's like, and the person says, look, I had three, you took away two, therefore three take away two is two. Uh, this is mathematical proof, this is a logical proof. What you have to tell them is that, listen, that's not how math works. The rule is you take from the whole, what's left over from that original, that's how you do subtraction. Not the amount that you take away, that doesn't make any sense. But see, there's rules established for math, 
And that person would look like a fool if they ever tried to you know, give you change like that. So we have rules for logic too. And when people don't know those rules for logic, that's how they can come and fall into these errors. So Allah says, most people are just following their dhan. They're just following their, what they think is true. It's their conjecture. The verse continues, إِنَّ ظَنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقْ شَيْئًا Your dhan, your conjecture, your assumptions, these whims that you have, they will never substitute and they'll never come in the place of haq. You'll never be able to get to haq by assuming things and, guess, and playing guessing games. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَفْعَلُونَ Allah knows exactly what you're doing. When you think you're being logical, when you think you're being scientific and academic and quote-unquote ilmi and rational and civil, Allah knows you're just actually making things up. Right? You can't fool Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the first idea we have is this idea of using science or using the aqad, using rational proofs and intellect is obviously not going to get us towards what Allah wants because we naturally will have disagreements about that. So we need something else which can show us a single path which is indisputable. That is, that is unable to be destroyed, right? That's not just dhan, it's not an assumption, but it's actually a straight path and a straight connection towards truth. So let's see if we can find that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So some might say, okay, so I'm not going to use my intellect, we can't use science. So basically what we as people need to do is somehow just, why don't we just ask Allah? Why can't we just pray and say, Allah? We're having a confusion, you know, we're having a question over here. We need to know if, for example, if somebody commits X act, uh, should they receive the death penalty? Should they be you know, lashed? Should they be put in prison? Should we give them a reward? Should we just you know, torture them? What exactly do we do? If somebody commits a crime, right, what do we do to them? And then you'd be sitting there like, okay, waiting for Allah to give you this ilham, this inspiration. Some people say that we should have this direct connection to Allah, and that's how we have to get the answer. Of course, we're going to fall on that same issue, right? Normally, in our lives, we don't do something like this anyway, right? Sometimes the ideology that we expect from religion is the same. We don't use that ideology anywhere else in life. As an example, let's say your iPhone is messed up. I'm using Apple as an example because I hate Apple and I think their products are horrible. So it's, it makes sense, right? Your, your iPhone messes up because they will mess up because they're terrible. I'm an Android user. So your, your iPhone messes up. Now, what do you do? Who do you call? Have any of you ever called Steve Jobs, like done tawassal to him, like Steve Jobs, please show me what I have to do when my, my you know, the, the application falls and crashes. Have you ever called the factories in China, okay, excuse me, what am I supposed to do? Right, my phone's not turning on. No, nobody does that. Okay. Your car breaks down, right? You hear some weird sounds in your engine. Have you ever called up Honda or Nissan or Toyota to figure out what's going on? I'm mentioning only Japanese companies because I don't like American car companies. See, I, I, don't, I'm, I never claimed that I was objective. I have biases in everything that I'm saying, and especially in this stuff. Please buy imports. Although, again, now Trump's going to be even more unhappy with me, but whatever, it's okay. Nobody ever calls up the actual creator and manufacturer of anything. Right? In our lives, we don't do that. So why is it that all of a sudden with Allah now, okay, let's call him up and let's see what we're we supposed to do in our lives. No. Usually, in our lives, we expect some sort of middleman. We expect somebody else who's provided this kind of medium, this path, we ask that individual, right? For the iPhone, you usually go to an Apple store, right? Or you go to the Guru, for example. For Honda, your, you know, your, your Honda, your Nissan, your Toyota, your car, you go to a mechanic, somebody who's trained in this stuff, right? Who's researched that stuff, who may have had some sort of training from that creator, not directly from that creator, right? So then what we say is, okay, now who's going to be our connection to God? Because if somebody wants to say, still, no, 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 we have to go directly to God, we say, okay, how are we going to know and be able to determine whether you're getting that truth or not? How are we going to tell that if one person comes, X person comes and says, well, I talked to Allah, and they said we have to, for example, use the death penalty. Somebody else says, well, I asked Allah as well, and they said that we have to leave the person alone. What, how are we going to tell the difference? How do we know who's telling the truth or not? That same issue that we said with the intellect, with science, we're going to be stuck in the same thing. We can't distinguish between who's right and who's wrong. And again, we need to find the right answer. That's what we're after. We're after haq, truth. Allah says in chapter 5, Surah Ma'idah, verse 35, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqu Allah, wa abtuqu ilayhil wasila. O you who have iman, O you who have belief, 
اتقوا الله have تقوى okay وابتغوا إليه وسيلة if you want to come to him use a وسيلة right this we mentioned at first uh, in not tonight uh, yes uh, today but last week we mentioned this in the Juma khutbah now, this is this verse is basically the easiest answer you can give to anybody who says you know why don't you just pray it to Allah directly why do you have to have a prophet or imam or somebody in between you and Allah well it's simple because Allah is saying it right here it's a very clear verse he's saying if you believe right if you have iman if you want have if you then Allah commands us to have taqwa he says okay come to me come to him wabtughu alayhi al wasila use a wasila use a medium just like you do in everything else in life so that's what we have to do now how do we figure out who is that medium how are we going to determine when people are coming and saying well i'm actually from god i'm the actual prophet i'm the representative how do we know how to determine that individual whether he's making things up whether he's trying to trick us or whether he's actually from allah sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad Whenever we have something in our lives, in our possession that we really care for, right? I'm, I don't mean emotionally. Sometimes it's just a physical connection, right? Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's an item you have, right? If you're an Apple user, it was your phone, your house, your car. All these things that we cherish, we want to protect. We obviously want to offer some sort of protection system for those things, right? So for the phone, if there's some valuable information on it, usually you have a password, right? For you to log in. For your house, usually you get an alarm system. Or your car, you know, security system. If you have valuable things in your house, inside your house, you put it, you put things inside a safe, for example. So there's always a desire. If you truly want something that you love to be protected, you naturally will go and make sure it's protected. And if it ever were damaged, right? Let's say you drop your phone and the screen cracks, somebody could say, "Well, you should have bought a cover. That's your fault." If your child opens your phone and starts messing with your things, you should have said, well, you should have put a lock on it. Right? This is your fault for not doing this. So, na'udhu billah. Somebody can say that, well, we're all in different sects. We're all in different, we're in disagreements. This is Allah's fault, na'udhu billah. He should have put a protection right here. He should have given us a way to get to the truth. And Allah says that He has done that, right? In Surah Al-Layl, chapter 92, verse 12, He says, inna alayna lal huda. Saying, listen, hidayat, guidance, that's on me. I'm going to take care of that. Don't worry. So now, how is Allah going to put this protection system, put this password protection, this alarm system, this security system, this lock screen? What does He do when it comes to the truth? How does He protect the truth? How does He protect His message and His risala, His hidayah, His guidance? How are His representatives protected and given this sort of password that we have the key to and we can now unlock? This is the concept of having a mu'jiza, a mirror. This miracle, this mu'jiza is our key to figuring out who's actually from Allah and who's actually just making things up as they go along. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. Somebody's claiming that, listen, that all-powerful master, gifter of existence, the all-knowing, the all-compassionate, all-merciful, has sent me down and I'm supposed to share what he wants with you. Okay, so if you have that connection with him, then you should have something that we can't get. You should have access to some information, some power that general individuals can't do. Because if a regular individual can do it, then how can we tell the difference? It has to be something very specific, something ex extraordinary that normal humans cannot do. Some say, okay, um, we have things like magicians or jinn, or illusionists. These guys can do these crazy tricks too, and most of us can't do that as well, right? How do we tell the difference between some guy who, whatever, floats, or does these card tricks, or, I mean, even right now, if I were just to make a fireball for my hands, would you call that a mu'jizah or not? How do we determine what is a real mu'jizah versus what is fake, which is, what's just a trick, what's magic, what's an illusion? So this, our ulama say that there's three distinctions for a mu'jizah versus a fake mu'jizah, a fake miracle. First one, they say, is the source of that knowledge. Okay. If right now, I was able to take my hand, right, and create a fireball, right, with that assumption, this is something that I would have to go and train years and years, right, to go to Tibet or to visit some master of Tai Chi or Kung Fu, and you can learn that, right? There's videos of people who are able to raise their body temperature, and they can melt ice or break ice just by touching it. So they have these kind of extraordinary abilities, right? And there's a lot of shows on 
Discovery Channel, National Geographic, where they show individuals who can do that. And for us, it seems extraordinary, but the source of that is, listen, anybody can do this. All you have to do is go study, practice, and then you can do it for anyone. Right? So it's, it's great only because you don't have it right now. But it's actually something that we all have access to. A prophet of God, on the other hand, won't be studying, won't be training for this. They'll literally just be given something right then and there, and they can perform it without any sort of training whatsoever. And this is something that no one else can perform. That's one. The second is purpose. Now, typically, these magicians or illusionists, what they're doing is basically in order to get attention to themselves. Right? They're usually not calling you to somebody else, like turn back to this person, this person. They're saying, look at this power that I have. Now, that, you know that basket? Why don't you put some money in there and maybe I'll do some more tricks for you. Or watch my TV show. Watch my HBO special. Right? That's what these guys do. They're out there for attention. They're out there for money. But a prophet is not like that. Right? A Nabi, somebody who's actually from Allah, says, listen, Allah is the one taking care of me. Right? Uh, my risk, my sustenance is coming from him. I'm trying to get you to turn back to him. Right? Which is basically a warning for us. If somebody claims to be representing the deen of Islam and they're demanding some sort of reward for what they're doing, you know, we have to call that into question. Right? So the second thing is about what's the purpose for why they're coming. On one hand, you see these magicians or jinn or illusionists calling you to themselves, calling you just for their own purposes, their own benefit. Whereas a Nabi, a prophet, a person, a man who's commanded and coming from Allah wants to do that work, is going to take you back to Allah and always point back to Allah and do that ishara. They'll say, listen, my purpose, the only thing I want for you is for you to perfect your life, for you to perfect your soul, to get better akhlaq, to learn, to improve, right? to spiritually elevate. That's all I want from you. I don't want any rewards. You know, I don't want anything like that. So this is the, the next distinction. And the third way you can tell is based on the person's characteristics, their actual akhlaq, their adab. What type of characteristics does this individual actually possess? Right? Typically what we see, again, besides the idea of having that need for attention, right? the people who are going to be sent from Allah, if they're going to be our role models, they have to possess this kind of, these traits, which is some, obviously something we're going to look up to. Now, if, for example, a person who claims to be a prophet is coming and says, hey, listen up, you idiots, I've got to tell you about Allah. If you don't listen to me, then go to hell. I don't really care. Well, which person would follow somebody like that? None of us would, right? Even if he gives us rational proofs, even if he were to just magically create fire out of his hands, whatever mu'jiza he had, say, listen, I don't want to follow somebody like that, with that kind of trait, that kind of akhlaq, because, go back to what we said before, inbuilt, inherent in us is we already have this idea of what is goodness, what is badness, right? We know what's a good trait, what is a bad trait, what's good akhlaq, what's bad akhlaq. We already are expecting a certain level of morality. If that person, there are fitra, doesn't tie in with what that individual should have, then we say, listen, this can't be from Allah, this can't be from God. We're expecting a person to have this kind of compassion and mercy and, you know, characteristics which should be above and beyond what everybody else has. You know, I can find somebody who's not from God who can be a jerk, but you're coming from God and you still have that same characteristic, well, what's the difference now? And sometimes this is the accusation and this is the criticism leveled by non-Muslims against us, right? They say, listen, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, you're a person who claims to believe in a God, and you have this, you know, all these books and these, these stories and you know, these scholars coming and telling you how to improve your lives. But over there, you guys are chopping people's heads off, you're executing individuals, you're you know, committing domestic abuse, you're liars, you're cheaters, you know, you're, you're terrible individuals. Okay, so if we have atheists who are doing the same thing, then what's the difference between you and I? Or if I have a good person who happens to be an atheist, then now that person is going to be better than somebody who believes in religion. Why would we want to follow your faith if we can't do that? Of course, the mistake that they're making is that their belief, their belief system is that a person is always fully represented of a deen, which is not, not the case, right? When Einstein has basically given the technology and the information necessary to create a nuclear bomb, that's not representative of the field of science, right? That's just what one person did, as Einstein later regretted that he did that. That doesn't show you what science is all about. Yes, science can be used to destroy mankind. It can also be used to help mankind. What's the purpose of it? For Dean, we would tell and answer this person the same thing. Our religion offers us a path to get better, to improve ourselves, to elevate. If somebody wants to, doesn't want to follow that path, it's not the path's fault. That's the person's fault. And we don't associate with that individual. Everybody's struggling in their day-to-day -day lives. We're trying to be better individuals. But you can't attack us for not always following it. 
right? In the same way that in a scientist's life, in an atheist's life, somebody who claims to be rational and logical, in your lives as well, there's going to be points in your life where you're not being rational or logical as well. We're all trying to improve ourselves. So why is it that you want to hold yourself to a different standard than us? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We'll stop here for now. We'll continue tomorrow and answer the next thing. What are some of the other characteristics of, of, of miracle? Right? One thing is that it's based on the experts of that time. So we'll mention some of the examples of the previous prophets. And then we'll mention some characteristics which makes our prophet's mu'jiza something different. Something very special. Meaning the Qur'an. And then we'll kind of have a say, theoretical discussion amongst us about, okay, when inshallah our Prophet Imam returns, is there going to be some sort of miracle that he brings for us? Is there going to be some sort of merit or milak or criteria that we can use now? And that even as ourselves, you know, people always ask the question, when the imam at the time returns, how do I tell the difference between somebody who's a real imam and a false imam? How do I know that I'll be picking the right individual? We've seen right now individuals in different countries, in Iran and Iraq, people are claiming I'm the Mahdi. And individuals are following them. Right? How, you, as, as Shias, who, people who claim to be followers of Ahlul Bayt, we're waiting for the imam, but how do we protect ourselves and make sure that we don't follow the wrong individual? We'll try to answer those questions tomorrow, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This topic of nubuwa that we started today, it's very fitting for this night. As we talk about our Rasul, tonight we commemorate and honor the personality who basically was the representative, the Shabih of Rasulullah. At Karbala. After the Prophet had passed away, you know, people who didn't live during that time or who lived at the time of the Prophet but weren't able to ever meet him or see him, when they'd come to Medina, they'd ask, you know, tell us, Ahl Medina, what, what, what did our Rasul look like? What was he like? How did he act? How did he walk? How did he eat? How did he smile? You know, tell us about him. When people would ask this, they would call Ali ibn al-Akbar They say, look at this individual He has the face of Rasulullah He has the voice of Rasulullah He has the mannerisms of Rasulullah He recites the adhan like Rasulullah this, this is the shabih of Rasulullah Perhaps this is the reason why When asked this question Imam gave this answer Somebody had asked our fourth Imam salam, Ya ibn Rasulullah This is after the tragedy of Karbala They asked Imam Sajjad Ya ibn Rasulullah out of all the shuhada, whose musiba was the worst for our Hussein? Whose musiba, whose shahada was the toughest for Hussein to watch and for Hussein to handle? Tell us, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. Imam Sajjad would cry and he would say that the worst musiba, the thing that destroyed my father was when he saw and he had to witness the death and the shahada of my brother, my brother Ali al-Akbar. The way that my father went to the body of Akbar, he didn't go like this to anybody else's body. They say someone at Karbala who was a witness there said that, Wallah, the way that Hussein cried for Akbar, he didn't cry for anyone else. He says that Hussein cried so loudly that even the enemies began to cry when they heard the cries of Hussein. This is how connected Hussein was to his son Akbar. On the way to Karbala, Imam Hussein has a dream. Ajrukum Allah. We know the history of Sadaran. Hussein has the dream. And he shares the dream with his qafila that we're all going to reach shahada, that we'll all be losing our lives and be going towards Jannah when we reach Karbala. He told this dream to his son. And now look how he raises his child. He says, Ya Abata, Alasna al haq aren't we on the right path? Aren't we on truth? Bala ya bunayya. Of course we are. And then he gives his famous line. Akbar gives his famous response. It doesn't matter whether we go towards death, whether we pounce on death, or death pounces on us. This is how you raise somebody with a strong Muslim identity. On the morning of Ashura, when Hussein wants to show the enemies, wants to give them a hujjah, itmam a hujjah, when he wants to 
expressed love and mercy and compassion to the enemies on the other side. He tells Akbar, Ya Akbar, Adhin, give him the adhan. Because your voice is like Rasulullah's voice. Perhaps when they hear the voice of Rasulullah again, maybe they'll wake up. Maybe they'll come to their senses and maybe they'll leave the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. His voice was just like Rasulullah's. He says, let them hear the voice of Rasulullah one more time so that if they still continue afterwards, they have no excuse on the Day of Judgment. This is how a ma'asum, somebody who is a representative of Islam, tries to bring people out of darkness into light. Not through harshness, but through love, through always giving them hujjah, always giving them a chance, always giving them the benefit of the doubt. Mu'mineen, mu'minat, we know every other companion would come, every other sahaba, all the other members of the family, they would have to come one by one to Hussein and say, Hussein, give us ijazah, let us go out for battle. Ya Hussein, do you give us permission? Will you let us go? Abbas would come ask for permission. On Muhammad asked for permission. Qasim asked for permission. Habib, Hur, everybody came and asked for permission. But Hussein, when he wants to start the battle from Bani Hashim's side, he comes to Ali al-Akbar, he says, Taqaddam ya Bunayya. He tells his son to go forward. This is the representative of Banu Hashim. This is his son. This is his pride and joy. He says, Taqaddam, go forward ya Bunayya. Oh my dear son. But before you go, go say al to the women. Go say your khudafis. Go give your last salams to the women, to the Ahlul Bayt. When he comes to the tents of the women and he finally gives his salams, he says his farewell, he says his khudafis, his salam. There was a person who was watching from far away reporting on what was happening at Karbala. And he said that at this point when Akbar was leaving, was trying to leave this tent, it looked like a janaza was taking place. He said every time Akbar would step out, the woman would pull him back inside. Again and again, Akbar would try to take a step, somebody else would pull him back inside. The woman would not let Akbar leave. He would take one step, Sakina would grab him and pull him back inside. He would take another step, and his mother would take him and pull him back inside. Another step, Zainab would come back and say, Ya Akbar, oh my dear son, Ya Bunayya, come back, let us do ziyara of Rasulullah one more time before you leave. So Sakina would say, Akhi, but all that, um, don't go like this. Don't leave just yet. Stay with us a few more minutes. We have nobody left. We want you to stay here so we can do ziyarat of Rasulullah. <laughs> finally, the women were allowed to give him ijazah so we can leave. When Akbar finally came out, he saw his father one more time. Hussein came and tied the imama on the head of his son. He kissed his forehead. He told him, now go out, make me proud. Go out and fight for Islam. Fight on behalf of me. Go and represent Banu Hashim. As he goes out, Hussein recites this beautiful dua, a father's dua for his son. He says, Allahumma ushud ala haula il qawm, faqad baraza ilayhim ashbahu nas, khulqan wa khalqan wa mantiqan bi rasulik, wa kunna id ashtaq naz yarat al nabiyik nadarna ilay. Ya Allah, bear witness, look, bear witness against this qawm, these people. Someone is going in front of these individuals who's just like your Rasul, he's the Shabi of your Rasul. His akhlaq is like the Nabi's akhlaq. His features are like Rasul's features. His speech is the Prophet's speech. Everything is like the Prophet. When I want to do ziyara of your Nabi, Ya Allah, I will just look at my son Akbar. Ali al-Akbar runs out onto the battlefield. He begins fighting the enemy one by one. Some narrations say he kills 120 men at first. Umar ibn Sa'ad tries to send one of his champion fighters, but Akbar sends him to hell. When Hussein sees that his son is fighting valiantly, but he sees that perhaps it's getting too much for him, he knows that Akbar is destined to become shaheed. He knows that his son's supposed to reach Jannah, but still, he's a father, he's watching his son fight like this. He still has a wish in his heart to see his son one more time. But Hussein knows that the dua of a mother is never denied. So he calls Layla, he says, Layla, come here. I want you to make dua so that we see our son one more time. So they say that Layla raises her hand, she comes outside and makes this dua, Ya man rada Yusuf ila ya aqub, ridda ilayya waladi. <laughs> ya Allah, you brought back Yusuf to ya aqub, bring back my Yusuf, bring back my son to me. Allah answers the dua of this mother. Ali al-Akbar comes back to the tents. He comes back like a young child, almost like, he, we know how old he was, but he comes back with the way a young child expects his father to see him. He says, Abata, did you see the way that I was doing my jihad? Did you see the way that I attacked the enemies? Marhaba, marhaba, ya bunayya. Yes, I saw what you did. I'm very proud of you. But now Hussein has to have his heart broken by the words of Akbar. Akbar says, Abata, al-atash qad qatalan. 
العطش قد قتلني وإقل الحديد إدهلني فهي شربة مما بابا this thirst is killing me if only I had a little bit of water Baba, this sword that I have is starting to feel heavy now. I don't know if I can fight the way that I fought before. If I could have just a little bit of water, then I can go back out and do jihad. Baba, can you do anything for me? Now Hussein begins to cry. You fathers, you know, all we want in our lives is to do and to fulfill the wishes of our children. Hussein is sitting there brokenhearted that my son is asking me for something and I can't fulfill his wishes. Bunayya, I have no water to give you. I have no water for you. I have no water for Qasim. I have no water for own for Abbas. I have no water for your brother Ali al Asghar. I have nothing to give you. Maybe if you take my ring and you put it in your mouth, maybe the coolness of that ring will quench your thirst. Ajrukum ala Allah. Akbar gets back on his horse. He rides back out onto the battlefield. As he starts going out again, he begins hearing footsteps behind him. Perhaps he thinks the enemy is there. He turns around, he sees that Hussein is there coming back after him. He says, Abata, you already gave me ijazah. We said we had our wida. We said salam. You said your khadaf is, why are you following me? We already, we already departed. We, we, we know what's going to happen now. You know I have to go out and fight. Hussein says, Ya Bunaya, you've never been a father. You don't know what this feeling is in my heart right now. You don't know what it is to see a father like me seeing his son leave him for the last time. Do me one last favor. As you start going out, don't run out so fast. Don't go out so quickly. Every few steps, turn back around and look at me so I can do ziyarah of Rasulullah over and over and over again. Umar ibn Sa'ad sees what's happening. He calls one of his soldiers. He says, who's going to kill? Who's going to send this individual to hell? La'anatullah alayh. One individual says, may the sins of all the Arabs be on my soul. If I don't kill this young boy, if I don't kill this young boy and cause Hussein the utmost grief. This person comes towards Akbar. He has a spear, a strong spear in his hand and he, sh he sends it straight into the chest of Akbar with so much force that the blade gets stuck in the chest of Akbar. Another enemy comes from behind and hits Akbar on the top of his head. Blood starts to come out and Akbar begins to start feeling dizzy from the blood loss that he faces. And they say, according to narrations, he loses so much blood that now he begins to feel dizzy. He begins to feel woozy. And he has to keep his balance. So he grabs the neck of his horse and begins to lower himself. But when that blood starts to trickle down, it falls on the eyes of his horse. And now the horse doesn't know which way to go. And they say, according to narrations, the horse runs straight into the enemy tents. Runs straight into the enemy camp. One by one, the enemies are striking a defenseless Ali al-Akbar over and over again. Don't you have any shame? He's defenseless. When it became too much for Akbar, when he had no more strength left, he fell off his horse on the sands of Karbala. He turns back towards the tent. He turns towards his father. Abata, abata, alayka minni as-salam. Abata, abata. Some of the narrations say the Imam wasn't able to come to him right away. Akbar is laying there thinking, why isn't my Baba coming to me right now? I'm calling for him. He's coming. He came to everybody else. Why doesn't he come to me? The thought crossed his mind that maybe because I told him that I was thirsty and maybe Hussein is ashamed. Maybe my father is ashamed that he doesn't have water. So now Akbar calls out, Abata, Jaddi qad saka, saka, <laughs> Jaddi qad sakani. My, father, my grandfather Rasulullah is here. He's giving me water. Don't worry. He's quenching my thirst. Akbar, your son's not thirsty anymore, Baba. I just want to see you one more time. Come to me. Someone else who was a witness at Karbala said, when they were watching Hussein go towards Akbar from far away, they couldn't understand what Hussein was doing. He was doing something very ajib. They said Hussein would take a few steps. He would be running. Then he would sit down. Then he would get back up, begin running again. And then he would sit down on the sands again. Up and down, over and over again. But he didn't know that what was happening was Hussein's heart was so broken. Hussein was crying so intensely that every few steps he took, he collapsed on the sands of Karbala. It's almost as if the sands of Karbala was pulling Hussein down, saying, Hussein, you're not ready to see what's happening to your son, Akbar. We don't want you to see what's going on with your son. Finally, Hussein reaches the body of his son, Akbar. The narration said that there were three things which just finally destroyed Hussein's heart. When he saw what happened to Akbar, three things destroyed Hussein. The first was that Akbar was writhing back and forth in pain, shaking violently. The second was that Akbar was hiding something and holding something over and so that Hussein couldn't see. 
And the third was the one that broke Hussein's heart the most. He saw that Zainab was already there near the body of Akbar. And he said, Zainab, what are you doing here? She was sitting there crying, Wa walada, wa 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 aliya. Hussein took Zainab back, said, Zainab, you don't belong here. He took Zainab back to the tent. Hussein then came back to Akbar. Mu'mineen, mu'minat, asadaran. You know, when Hussein went to every single person, when he went to their bodies, when he sat down, he would come, he would sit down next to their bodies. He would take their heads and put it in his lap. He would try to console them, right? He would talk to them. When he came to Hur, he took his head and put it on his lap. When he came to Habib, to An, Muhammad, he would take their heads and put it on his lap. Abbas, when he came, he put his head on his own lap. But they say when he came to his beloved, when he came to his Akbar, he threw himself on top of Akbar. His cheek he put on top of his son's cheek. Ajalukum ala Allah. Akbar turns to his father and says, Abata, Abata, this pain in my chest is killing me. Is there anything you can do for me, Baba? I want to leave this world without pain in my heart. What can you do for me? Can you remove this fear from my heart? Hussein tries what he can do every way that he pulls his fear. It keeps pulling the body of Akbar with it. So now Hussein has to muster every bit of strength that he has. He's broken hearted. He's tired. He's been carrying body after body. But Hussein says, this is the last wish of my son. I have to fulfill this. The narration say, he puts one knee on the sand of Karbala. <laughs> one knee he puts on the body of Akbar. <laughs> he takes his hands. He grabs the spear. He holds it with all his strength. He braces himself. Akbar is looking to his father, hoping that his father can help. Hussein now perhaps is turning his face towards Najaf, looking to his father for help, saying, Ya Ali, Ya Abata, Adirik me. Ya Ali, Madad. Hussein pulls the blade. <laughs> he pulls the blade from the body of Akbar. At this moment, the ruh comes out. Inna lillah. Wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Hussein is sitting beside the body of his son. Bonaya, Bonaya, this world has lost all meaning. I have nothing left. You're free now from all worries, but what has happened to your gharib, Father Hussein? Ya Allah, we ask you by the right of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, by the right of our beloved, by the right of our beloved Ali and Akbar, to forgive all mu'mineen, mu'minat, muslimin, muslimat, all of our marhumin, marhumat. Ya Allah, as parents, we ask you by the right of Ali and Akbar to help us raise our children like to the status of Ali and Akbar, who are who's, who are ready for death, and it doesn't matter for them whether death comes to them or they jump on death. Ya Allah, we ask you by the right of Ali and Akbar to make us parents who can raise a child like Ali al-Akbar, to give our children the ability to become children and to be children like Ali al-Akbar, to fight for the way of Islam. Ya Allah, we ask you by the right of the Ahlul Bayt and Ali al-Akbar to give us the tawfiq to become supporters of the Imam of our time. Wa akhra da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibina tawhira. Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, 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 Hussein.